Okay, I'm Amy Rahman. I'm the speech language pathologist at the Forbes Norris ALS Research Center, um, and I'm an augmentative communication specialist. Um, I've been at the center for uh, going on my 16th year now. And during that time, I've also worked with the ALS Association to help maintain the very vital uh, lending library of augmentative communication, too. So today, I'm going to be talking about the seven components of a highly effective communication system. So what I do um, at the center is my job is to work with patients and families to help maintain communication. And as you know, nowadays communication means a lot more than it did even 16 years ago when I started, let alone 100 years ago. Um, so we use all kinds of methods of communication, and each one of those are things that I do address and that we we'll work, work together on. Everything from iPhone to uh, social media, making sure people are still staying connected with their community, uh, family, um, and professional uh, uh, roles, staying involved in those professional roles and um, social roles. So this was a challenge to me when I was invited to come here, because what I like to do is work one-on-one -on -one with families and um, patients and really develop together uh, communication strategies, because everyone comes in with a very unique group of um, uh, challenges. So I, you know, and, and I'm ending up working with people who have bulbar onset ALS, obviously, who have speech problems, but I also work a lot with people who have uh, limb onset, uh, because computer access is a big part of how we all communicate now, too, and using your iPhone. So, you know, I'm really working with a variety of, of um, different, um, we're working on a variety of different solutions. And the important thing is that we work every stage of the way because needs change and new challenges come up. So what I wanted to do today, uh, I put together a handout and hopefully you have it. It's a little checklist of what I've come up with is when I look at all the work that I do with different, the variety of different people I work with, I've come up with seven components that really make up a comprehensive, complete communication system. I have extra handouts up here if anybody needs right. them. And everyone needs a pen or a pencil too. So you can have, take a moment to get that out. So basically the first, let's see, I thought I'd have a little laser pointer which I was excited about, but oh yeah, it's too small to even be worthwhile. Um, circled in gold are the seven components of um, communication that I work on with people. That's in the first column. And I'm gonna go over each one of them. And for each one, the next column is the goals. These are the actual tangible thing that I want to achieve with the person that I'm working with. So with each one of these, there'll be a, essentially a question. I can do this, um, this particular competency. And um, so I wanted it to be very tangible for people. Yes, you can, or are you having some challenges? Are you finding some barriers? Um, in the third column, I've come up with some examples, and by no means is this a complete list of all the interventions or the strategies we use, but it gives you just some ideas. And I'll go over, and today I'm gonna even do a few little um, show and tell uh, bits to just to, to help you understand a little bit about the different aspects of um, intervention. And then finally, um, what I want for this column is as we're sitting here today and you're hearing and you're seeing some examples and you're hearing about different challenges, I want you to think and um, just write down if anything sparks your imagination, if you're thinking, ooh, I could see where in the future I might have a problem with that or boy, this is already a problem and I didn't know there, you know, anyone was, would help me with this. I didn't realize it's not a medic medicine. Um, so there's, now you're realizing there are um, a team of people and who can help with many of these things. So, so get out you know, your pens and jot that and jot down. If you're someone who can't write, maybe now's the time to come up with a little signal for your partner when you'd like them to write something down for you because that's an intervention you're interested in. So we'll get right into them. So the first one is call chime. And the goal is I can alert people in other rooms or outside the home when I have a need or an emergency. 
And this is absolutely vital for everyone. And it's not just people without speech. So a lot of times Lee, our respiratory therapist, will come into um, the, the, my room and, and say to me, you know, I'm working with someone with a BiPAP mask who doesn't have strong arms and that person needs a way to notify someone in another room that he, he or she is having, um, needs something. Maybe just even a temperature change in the room. So we need, um, for someone who lives alone, it's really important whether they have maybe a speech problem or frequent falls or occasional falls, it's very important that they have some kind of call system that goes out, goes out into the community. And nowadays there's wonderful ones that have fall alert. You don't need to be able to speak to use one of these systems. Um, and there's even new ones with mobile GPS, which is fantastic and I need to learn more about. Um, the, also, I wanted to make it, one of the main things that we work on are alerting systems in the home. A simple solution is a wireless doorbell. So for people who do have good hand movement, you can notify someone in another room that you need them with just a wireless doorbell. But so many of our uh, patients don't have excellent hand movement, in which case we look at a lot of adapted call chimes, and I brought one in today. So these are call chimes that you, we have call chimes that you can activate with a slight touch of your toe, a slight movement of your elbow, a tilt of your head when you're in bed. And I brought one in, even eye movement, um, we have ways now that we can use that for alerting. So, and you probably can hear me fine. This is um, one of my favorite, very flexible solutions. This is a little uh, kind of teepee that's got two little clips on it. And it's some Velcro on the other side, too, if you want to use that. But it really is effective for just attaching to some sheets. And a person could just have it at the end of their bed and just slightly move their toe towards it. Might have it on a pillow. And then they can just tap it with their head and elbow, if that's the right thing for them in bed. And we've got, this is just one example of, of so many options for activating a call chime. The other thing, number two, I like to work on communication strategies with people. So if someone, um, you know, these are things that are going to uh, reduce, reduce the um, effort involved in communicating a lot of times and improve efficiency and speed. We all want to communicate at a fairly rapid pace. Um, and some communication solutions can be a little challenging that way. So these strategies are designed to help people keep up in conversation and just not, frankly, uh, conserve energy too. So if someone has a mild change, um, I might teach some partner and, and, and patient strategies. One of my favorite ones, I try to use as an example here, is um, partners often, if they miss one word, and so many times people will spend months or years where they're maybe 90% intelligible, meaning nine out of 10 words people are understanding, but instead, uh, if someone misses a word, a lot of times our reflex is to say, what? And then the person has to repeat the entire sentence again, and that's very fatiguing and frustrating, and a lot of people will end up saying, that's okay, never mind. So instead, what a lot of times I suggest is people repeat back, the partners repeat back what they did understand and just leave a blank. So if the person were to say, let's go to the movies at blank, uh, let's, go to the, let's go to the movies at, let's go to the movies at eight, and you didn't understand the last part, you could repeat back, let's go to the movies at blank. And the person would take a nice deep breath and just say, eight they wouldn't say the entire sentence back to you. And that's part of the training for the partner to don't say the whole thing again, just give me the one word. Um, another is for someone who has a moderate change, this can really help with uh, energy conservation and effectiveness of communication, and that is a, a voice amplifier, a little hands-free uh, voice amplifier. And then with more significant change, a lot of times what we, um, what I look at is if someone's using a speech generating device is programming some stored messages um, so that you don't have to type from scratch if you're always saying to people, you know, oh, it's so good to see you again. You don't want to type that out every time, store it and make it a simple, quick selection. So let me show you or let you hear what I'm talking about. So I'm going to open up uh, on an iPad. I've got a... Uh, 
<laughs> I'm just going to talk. I think. Can everyone hear me? So just give me a second. I'm going to open up a, an app, a text-to-speech app. And on this app, you can type on a keyboard. Everyone's probably, most people are familiar with the keyboard. And you could type this message from scratch. Or in a male voice, I've saved. It's great to see you. Let's just do that again. It's great to see you. Or I've got a female voice saying one of my favorite messages to have on a speech-generating device. Due to a medical condition, I'm unable to speak, but my hearing and thinking are fine, so you can speak normally to me. <laughs> right? That's a nice one to have ready to go. Okay. So uh, the third area that I work with people on are, is low-tech communication or written communication. Uh, super important. Um, with mild change, people, we still need the ability to, um, to write and use computers. So that's part of what I do in terms of low-tech communication. Um, sometimes just switching to a thicker barreled pen if you have mild change in your ability to write and grip the pen. Uh, with a more significant change, we might um, switch from using a touch screen to a mouse so you can just move slightly um, move your hand slightly to navigate a mouse instead of the effort to use a touch screen, which is much more fatiguing. Uh, with uh, significant physical changes, uh, we often look at alternative parts of the body and can still completely control computers with them. Some of you may have seen people use eye tracking or head tracking, even just switching to a, a joystick, or you'll see some examples coming up too. Uh, Low-tech communication also includes using communication boards. So I've got a couple of examples here, and these would be, uh, with low-tech communication, there's not text-to-speech like you just heard. Your partner is the person who is speaking aloud for you. But often, low-tech communication is wonderful because you're not relying on anything electronic. It's handy. You've got it in the middle of the night without a big process to turn it on. So everyone, everyone needs, if they're having any problem with speech, low-tech communication, too. So in the first example there, someone's using a uh, communication board with a stylus because maybe they can't isolate their finger anymore. Anymore. They might have originally been writing their messages, um, then pointing, and then pointing got difficult. We're just going to move to a homemade stylus now. Uh, the next picture, I've got someone who's using a laser pointer simply attached to his glasses. And because he um, doesn't have really any hand movement, he's able to communicate quite rapidly. This is a person that I've worked with years ago, and he was quite a rapid communicator um, using this laser pointer with a a communication board down there. I just wanted to give an example of another language. There's a Hindi board, Hindi alphabet. And in the corner over here, there's a communication board that doesn't require any movement. You just use eye movement to construct your messages for your partner. And again, I'm not going into how all these work. Just know they're there and talk to your speech therapist about these methods. 10 minutes, I couldn't get into it as that much. Finally, speech generation, which you saw a little bit of um, augmentative speech generation when I played those two messages for you. Um, so I want to always make sure you're able to communicate um, with a voice, important for the phone, important for talking to preliterate children. Um, you, could use your, you may be able to use your own speech. At a certain point, you may need some strategies to make it effective. Uh, you may find that an amplifier is all you need to make it effective. Then we also have, uh, there's uh, insurance funded speech generating devices and more and more people are using just mobile devices with uh, text to speech apps on them. And they work wonderfully too for many people. I definitely recommend the Windows uh, tablets over the iPad for a variety of reasons. So talk to your speech therapist before you purchase anything. Uh, I always want to make sure you're able to communicate with those at a distance, whether it means giving you access to the telephone or email or um, blogs or uh, Facebook. So that's another thing that we'd always want to work on and keep up on. Independent uh, setup of communication 
devices. Uh, super important. It's amazing. A lot of times I've, I've talked to people around the country and they'll end up getting a communication device. Once they've received it, kind of the services drift off. Everyone's so proud of themselves that they manage to do the evaluation and get this person delivered a speech generating device. And that's when you start needing help with it. It's um, We need even learning how to adjust the volume, switch languages if you speak two different languages. Um, adjusting the, the setup of it so that it, it's most appropriate for your body and not putting too much strain on your neck or your arms. So over here is just a good screen setup where the screen's at your eye level and you're not hunched over looking at a screen with a, maybe with using a touch screen, but using a mouse and sitting with total support of your neck and head, so important. Over here is just a little internet, um, a rolling mount that holds a tablet, wonderful though, not expensive. And then down here is a fantastic setup for using a trackball with your foot to control the computer. And that's just linked on to someone's footrest of their wheelchair. So all the wheelchair people out there, very cool. And finally, um, I always wanna make sure people are prepared with some proactive ideas for the future too. Um, for example, with no or mild, or mild changes in speech or no changes in speech, that's when I like to do voice and message banking, which is uh, getting a, a, get a sampling of your speech for, that can be either simply played on a speech generating device so it wouldn't always be synthesized speech or making a, a synthesized voice out of your own voice, which is another option that's called voice banking. With moderate changes in speech, we start early on looking at speech generating devices for people because you need to learn to use it, store some messages, get comfortable with it. You want to get it before you need to rely on it. And then with physical changes, if you're starting to have trouble with your access method for the communication device or computer, if it's starting to get fatiguing, we want to start looking. What's the next method? How can we tweak this to make it a little easier for you already? So those are the seven uh, areas that I just always make sure people are up to date with and I'm following them and we're, we're, we're set. Um, and I just also, so important to know you're not alone in this journey. No one needs to scramble home and start looking up things that I talked about online and trying to find it. You're not alone. There's a network of, of people and organizations um, and, and businesses that are more than happy to help you out with these solutions too. So a lot of times we'll tap your shoulder and say it's time for us to start looking at this, but now you have a list and I gave you a checklist and you may need to tap my shoulder and let me know, you know what, I think I need to figure out a call chime now. I, I'm ready to do that or I you know, need the next solution. So hopefully that list will serve as a tool so you can be sure to tap our shoulders when you need to too. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces here. Uh, I'm Lee Guion, and I'm the respiratory care practitioner at the Forbes North Center in um, San Francisco, California. And I'm going to be talking today about the seven best ways to maintain lung health. And I'm going to be following along and continuing with the themes that Dr. Loman Hurth and Amy Roman focused on in their talks. Um, about the multidisciplinary team and also trying to sort of have a, a vehicle, uh, so the seven best ways. I, I liked Amy's idea about that. Yes? Higher? How's that? That's too much? That's good? All right. I usually am a boomer, but, you know, in many ways. So, uh, all right. So in the absence of compelling new research on respiratory interventions um, in ALS, the consensus among respiratory care practitioners and pulmonologists is that we go back to basics and reinforce what we already know about the anatomy and physiology and the innervation of, um, of the lungs and lung muscles. And that we want to focus on what we know actually works, which is a team approach to care. Each member of your multidisciplinary care team has their own level of expertise, but we strive to integrate 
and combine our recommendations so that the sum is much more effective than the individual parts. The good news is that if you have been diagnosed with ALS and you do not have a pre-existing lung disease, your lungs are essentially healthy. ALS is not a lung disease and we should not be treating it as if it is a lung disease. Your airways and air sacs naturally scavenge and neutralize and eliminate any inhaled irritants, bacteria, or viruses that find their way into the sterile field. So our goal in respiratory management is to maximize, enhance, and support the normal, the normal lung function. And in this way, we hope to improve your quality of life, by helping you to breathe better, to sleep better, to have better energy levels, and decrease or, I hope, completely eliminate any hospitalizations and increase longevity. So the number one on my list of seven is infection pre prevention, and this really is the number one. So in our clinic, we strongly encourage the annual flu vaccine and that you also get the pneumovax or the pneumococcal vaccine that you treat early any symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection like a cold or even seasonal rhinitis to improve the chances that it doesn't um, morph into a lower respiratory tract infection, which would be much more difficult to manage. We want you to re reduce or avoid any exposure to irritating substances, especially smoke, and we emphasize good dental hygiene and oral care, which means basically good brushing and flossing, because we um, don't want the, an overgrowth of bacteria in the mouth, and we don't want any, um, any of the saliva containing a lot of bacteria to inadvertently migrate into your lower airway and um, so that's why we encourage you to work closely with your speech language pathologist uh, like Amy to see if you may be experiencing some inadvertent um, migration of um, upper airway secretions or saliva into your lower airway, which might cause a respiratory infection. We um, recommend that you um, Encourage all family members, friends, anyone visiting your home to do very good hand washing. And if they have a cold or any sort of respiratory infection, that they keep their distance and or wear a mask. Number two on my list is maintaining good hydration. I want, as a respiratory care pra practitioner, I want to ensure that your lung secretions maintain their normal, healthy balance. And the best way to do this is through adequate fluid intake, since the largest component of your airway secretions or mucus is water, at least 95%. The role of mucus in the normal healthy lungs is to lubricate the airways and trap and remove any foreign substances. And this is a continuous process that we're largely unaware of. So this is a graphic and a visualization of the sol and gel layers within in, um, in the lungs and a picture of the process of uh, the trapping and encapsulating of microbes and their elimination through the constant upward beating of the microscopic hairs that are called cilia. Number three on my seven list is nutrition. And why is nutrition important to lung health? And David has been, is going to go into that in more detail. But we burn calories to breathe. That's essentially caloric expenditure is one of the definitions of work. And when our lung muscles are strong, this requires very little caloric expenditure and maybe 
uh, accounted for only maybe one or two percent of our total caloric expenditure. But as our muscles weaken and we work harder just to breathe by breathing uh, more rapidly and more shallowly to compensate for decreased lung expansion, we will end up burning more calories. And if we are not able to consume the calories to make up for that increased work of breathing and caloric expenditure, we'll lose weight, we'll end up losing more muscle mass, and we can become malnourished, which then puts us at a much greater risk of infection. Movement and exercise is going to be covered in much more detail by Andrew, but I just want to say that we do encourage exercise, just not for the physical benefits, but also for the emotional and psychological benefits that, that it has for most of us. Um, and we would like to encourage your incorporating breathing exercises into your movement and stretching exercises. In, um, in our clinic, I uh, encourage early on in the disease process people to do what we call segmental breathing to sort of isolate the different segments of the lungs, um, to do lung hyperexpansion breathing, sometimes called breath stacking. This can be done independently. It can be done manually with a manual ventilation bag or later on in the disease process mechanically with a non-invasive ventilator or a cough assist device. And there are videos on this that can be accessed through the Amy and Pals website online, amyandpals.com, because uh, that needs to be reinforced uh, once we teach it to you in the clinic. But that uh, we hope that will be a good resource for you. Um, so breath work and paced breathing in combined with the treatment recommendations that your physical therapist and occupational therapist uh, make for you um, can really help in terms of energy conservation and really sort of a getting a, a two four. Um, other exercises that you might want to take advantage of in the community that, com that combine breath work with movement, stretching and strengthening are Tai Chi, Qigong, Pilates, and yoga. And uh, especially on a one-on-one -on -one session with any of these practitioners, um, they can take into account your um, mobility challenges, be, there, uh, be it upper or lower airway. I'm a little behind in my slides. So, uh, sorry, a good night's sleep is um, very important. And uh, we are learning that a healthy body needs more than just adequate nutrition and water, but we also need a very good night's sleep. And, lower? Oh, sorry. And, uh, and um, that's why when you come to clinic, on a quarterly basis, we always ask about the number of hours that you're sleeping, we ask about the quality of sleep, and we ask you if you're not getting um, adequate sleep or good quality of sleep, why you think that might be happening, what the barriers are so that we can address that and then do our best with you to help determine the cause and then try to make that better for you. Okay. Um, number six, uh, which is one of my areas of expertise as part of my um, position as part of our multidisciplinary care team, is maximizing lung expansion. I went into this a little bit earlier, but I want to go into a little more detail about the rationale for that. When you take a deep breath in, your airways initially expand in diameter, and then they expand in length. And the alveoli are the tiny air sacs at, at the very, at the, what we call the terminal end of your air sacs or bronchioles, are where your oxygen moves in on a breath and your carbon dioxide moves out on exhalation. And they expand like little balloons. And you have billions of these alveoli or little air sacs and they look like little clusters of grapes. And they're connected to one another through these little ports. So when you take an initial breath in, the air is going to follow the path of least resistance and flow into the al already well-inflated air sacs. But if your lungs have gotten weak, you're not taking as deep a breath, you're in a wheelchair for much of the day, 
And so um, the lower back part of your lungs are a little compressed. You may have deflated air sacs in the lungs or in certain areas of the lungs. By taking a slow deep breath in and then having a breath hold at the end of a maximal inhalation, the air will flow from the well-inflated air sacs into the adjacent, perhaps under-inflated air sacs, and pop them open. So that's why we instruct you to take a slow deep breath in and then have a breath hold or do a series of breath stacking maneuvers where you take a breath in, close your vocal folds, then take another breath on top of that and hold that, and a third breath on top of that, then try to hold your breath for two or three seconds, and then fully exhale. Um, one of the things that, um, let me see, yes, one of the things that, that this does as well is um, create sort of a pressure head at the alveolar level so that when those air sacs are well expanded and all that pressure has been built up in the lowest and furthest part of the lungs, when you go to exhale, there is a higher velocity of flow that comes through your bronchioles and then the larger airways. And this is assisting the, um, your little beating cilia and your mucus to eliminate any trapped particles, bacteria, viruses that might be there. It augments that naturally occurring lung cleansing process. Okay. Not only are these exercises very beneficial to the lungs and are maximizing your, the normal breathing, but um, it also can help give you a sense of control especially if you are starting to feel short of breath. And that usually creates a sense of anxiety. And with a sense of anxiety, we often start panting or breathing more rapidly and shallowly. And that in turn then can make us feel more short of breath, which leads to more anxiety. And then you get into this positive feedback loop. Slowing down, taking in a slow, deep breath, and more importantly, fully exhaling with each breath. Because often when we feel like we can't get a breath in, it's because we're breathing so rapidly and shallowly that we have not fully exhaled. So by stopping and taking a breath in through your nose and then exhaling all that breath out through your mouth, through what we call pursed lips, like you're whistling, you'll get a natural elastic recoil in the lungs that will fill them up. So if you feel like you're having trouble getting a breath in, think about breathing out. And your physical therapist or occupational therapist can often work with you to incorporate these breathing exercises into an exercise or stretching routine. Through this, you will conserve your energy more. It'll also give you a sense of greater control in any environment. And it's good to do this with your partner and spouse because I think we're all under a lot of stress. There's often a lot of anxiety associated with ALS. Where are we going with this disease? And I think everyone needs to do this type of breath training just to sort of bring everyone back to the present and to the moment. Lung volume replacement, Dr. Lomanhurth referred to this. Uh, you might hear it referred to as BiPAP by level positive pressure breathing, non-invasive ventilation, or um, non-invasive positive pressure breathing. There are more and more uh, new microprocessor ventilators and positive pressure breathing devices out there that will deliver um, a breath that's volume targeted or pressure targeted. And there certainly is no time to go into all of those now. But your respiratory care practitioner can help you um, decide which breath delivery is best for you. When was a question that uh, came from the internet. And what we do is measure your lung function at every clinic visit. And it's a combination of um, the decline in your lung function and your symptoms of respiratory insufficiency. 
combination of the two. It might be that you, when we do your lung function testing, they are within normal limits when you're sitting up in clinic, but you're reporting to us that you're waking up with headaches in the morning, you're feeling more fatigued, you're feeling like you, there's a heaviness on your chest when you lie down. Um, then what I will do is repeat those tests when you are lying down in a supine position to see if weakness in your diaphragm has caused a drop in your lung function when you don't have gravity to assist you and you have some abdominal um, volume displacing some of your lung volume displacement. And then that might be a really good time to start. But we encourage you to start using assisted breathing as soon as possible to allow you to acclimate to it. Otherwise, we're sort of chasing our tails in a way. So um, through all of these seven techniques for improving your overall lung health, um, we are hoping to improve and maintain your physical your physical condition, and I think as important, your emotional and psychological one, and to create an overall environment for you and for your whole team that tends to be positive and hopeful. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to say, uh, introduce myself first. My name is Andrew Louie, and I'm the physical therapist that's been working at the UCSF ALS Center. I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Norman Hurth and her team for almost 14 years, I think, now. So it's been a while. Um, thank you again for the ALS Association for inviting me to speak. And I hope, I'm not sure where to stand here, but uh, hopefully it will make this an interesting talk for you. And my topic for today has to do with exercise. And I put down the why, when, and how before I really realized I was supposed to do seven. So, sorry about that, but hopefully, yeah, yeah, but thank you uh, for uh, your attention. So, I'm uh, also the uh, part of this uh, clinical faculty at UCSF, so that's my other role. Um, the main reason for us to talk about this today, though, has been that uh, almost everyone that comes through our clinic will ask me at some time or another about exercise. You know, what do I do? What are the best things? And I think it's sometimes confusing because going onto the internet, I think you'll see different, different opinions Almost every time you click on a button, somebody will say something differently. So I hope to clarify this as we go along. So the first question that comes to me usually is, uh, should people with ALS or PALS, as we say, exercise? And if so, sorry, uh, then why, when, and how should they exercise? So I want to go through that today as much as I can. So the first question Dr. Lomar has already kind of addressed, I think, and pretty much I think the conclusions are pretty solid now. But some still argue that maybe exercise isn't a good idea. Maybe there's going to be a, a, a facilitation or a speeding up of the disease process. And that's because as much as the scientists are looking towards understanding the complete mechanism of ALS, I don't think it's, we're there yet. And so uh, likewise, if people look at the research on other diseases of the nerves, uh, maybe muscular dystrophy or other things related to it, they'll say, well, gosh, if we take people and have them exercise very hard and long, they seem to get worse. And the final argument that some might make is that, you know, in earlier studies, they would find that people who had a, a history of exerting themselves a lot, people in manual labor or uh, athletes, professional athletes in particular, might actually be more likely to get ALS. So those were the arguments, oh, be careful, don't do too much. Uh, but really, I don't think that really holds much water in the latest research. For the most part, we really don't know of any mechanism through which exercise would cause ALS. And other people, we also think that exercise would help what they call ox oxidative stress, which means a sort of a chemical reaction in our bodies that create damage, in particular, in our case, nerves. Um, other diseases like, um, again, muscular dystrophy or other types of neurological problems, if you look at the research, people who do it in a reasonable fashion, and we'll talk about what reasonable means, really don't get worse. And there's often improvements that Dr. Lohman Hurth uh, and uh, Lee alluded to earlier. We'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, there really doesn't seem to be that much faith in the, in the studies earlier on that uh, there's a higher proportion of people who get ALS in those who exert themselves. So the answer to the should, I think, is a pretty resounding yes. So why? Well, the thing that I want you to, to think about then is, well, should we be careful? Or, or, so why would we want to exercise? And are, are we having enough problems uh, you know, with our energy levels to begin with? Well, that can happen. But the things that I want you to pay attention to, and this laser is a little weak, but the exercise has not been shown to be harmful. Okay. 
So no harm reported in, in studies, and there's really good, no evidence that there are people who exercise when they have ALS get worse faster. So that's important because we never want to do harm. Uh, very clearly in the research, too, you'll see that inactivity leads to deconditioning and poor quality of life and health in general. So really, a uh, really nice study by Booth uh, actually discussed that there is just about no physical function and probably any mental function that's aided by inactivity. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we want to know is that uh, there is good evidence that exercise helps people with ALS. So breathing function, functional movement, muscle strength, as uh, Dr. Norman Hurth alluded to earlier, and exercise may benefit a lot of the things that Lee talked about too, quality of life, our mood, our endurance. If you have the problem of spasticity or stiffness, it can address that as well, and pain as well. So almost there's no much, not there's much, much, uh, um, much the argument of not exercising, as we said. So again, going to why, uh, this is a chart that Dr. Lomerhurth put up earlier, and it lists all the sort of top 10 players, if you will, for symptoms that people with ALS have. And here again, it, on, on the bottom here is the percent. So if you look at these, what I want to point out really quickly here is that there's, uh, sorry, there's a little problem with my boxes there, but all of those symptoms that we're talking about there can be addressed by exercise. They don't go away because you exercise, but I think uh, exercise will mitigate most of those. And maybe even we might think, and I'll ask, we can ask David if constipation might be slightly improved by doing exercise as well. So again, it seems like a pretty good deal for us to do this. So the next question would be when. And I like to talk about it in big picture and little picture. To me, little picture means that when we're talking about it, should we, you know, on a particular day or a particular week, should we exercise? Is this the right thing to do? And I have to use, I have to do, a, I have to admit to copying out and giving an, a pat answer and saying, well, when it feels right, that's when you should exercise. So that's pretty obvious. But, but I mean, what I mean by that, though, is that when I talk to people on a day, with their daily routine, they have good days and bad days. And I think on a good day, when everyone's feeling good and feeling energetic and feels like you know, they can conquer the world, why not? There shouldn't be any reason from what we know so far. On the other hand, there might be a bad day a day when you wake up and you're tired or you're just feeling short of breath or anything like that. I don't think in those cases it's really worth it for someone to push through because maybe a better day is just around the corner. Okay? So I don't think I push people to exercise. I tell them to be reasonable and use their common sense as far as when they should on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. So I do think that we, sh we are a, a pretty good idea that any fatigue or weakness that comes as a result of exercise should be fairly contained. 30 minutes, 60 minutes afterwards, not much longer than that. If we do more than that, we might think that maybe those people who would argue that this, uh, exercise is bad for neurological problems, they might be right because we're pushing ourselves to the point where maybe that uh, toxic environment that occurs with excessive uh, stress might occur. Okay? And I do think that it should be safe and enjoyable. That's one of the big requirements I have. Now, I, by big picture, I mean, you know, if from the time that someone ex first experiences symptoms to the time where they're very weak and really don't even think about exerting themselves very much, then when do we, what do we do and when do we do it? Well, early on, I think, you know, when people are first no starting to notice things, maybe the diagnosis has just come, I think that's the time to really just stick with what you, what you're already doing, and that is to stay active. As we'll talk about different types of exercise, I just want people to think about, I advise people to think about what they're doing on their daily routine, both physical activity-wise and exercise. So it doesn't have to be exercise. It could be being in the yard and doing things. It could be doing the chores around the house, house projects. But I encourage people to think about what they're doing in terms of what it does for their heart, for their muscles, for their balance, and for their flexibility. And if someone's doing activities that kind of address all four of those, I think that's good enough. At this point, a particular stage, I don't tell people not to try something new if they're really interested in doing so, but I don't think it's a have to. I don't think it's an obligation, okay? And if someone does do it, as we'll talk about, I usually say start slow and, and go from there. The middle phases when things are starting to change is when I usually tell people to be more selective and modify what they're doing. So I want people not to feel like they're obligated to do what they did in the past, but I want them to use their common sense to say, okay, this is harder, but when I do it this way, this feels better. Or that, you know, today I'm not going to because I have a party, a, dar a dinner party later tonight and I want to save my energy for that party. I think that's what I tend to encourage people to do. 
I think the middle phase is when things are starting to change is when people should start to focus on range of motion stretching type exercises as well for preventative maintenance. And so we don't want to have pain and stiffness as an issue later on. I think we want to start that process at this point. Okay, and later on, as we said, as things get more difficult to move around, the range of motion stretching tends to be the main emphasis. Okay. So how? I have this horrible looking chart that I'm going to read to you right now because that's what you want to hear at the, this time in the afternoon. No, 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 I wouldn't do that to you, I promise. Uh, I just want to point out a couple of things. One is that, you know, we'll, we broke it down just a minute ago into cardiovascular strength, stretching, balance, and uh, exercise. And they, those are sort of the purposes. As uh, Lee was speaking about uh, combination programs, or what we call mind-body programs, yoga, tai chi, qigong, pilates, a lot, of, uh, a lot of research going into that, and I think they're very viable as um, exercise options for PALS. Um, but those sort of have a, I put them under the category of combination because they have multiple purses, purposes as noted above. And finally, aquatic exercise. A lot of people find that very uh, soothing and very helpful. I think that's another viable option. So we're just going to talk about these in sort of a different context for a minute here. Uh, again, a large chart. I just want you guys to have as reference. I don't think I need to sh share every detail of this chart. But the one main point I want you to get out of this chart is this. We have all the, you have all these different options for exercise. If you looked at the risks versus benefits, you know, we always talk about that risk versus benefit ratio. Risks, you'll see over here in this column, well, they're the same for someone who has ALS and someone who doesn't. Having ALS itself, to me, doesn't increase the risk of injury or risk that you're going to hurt yourself. I tend to tell people, I don't think you're going to hurt yourself without knowing it. I don't think it's going to sneak up and you'll say that I did some wonderful exercise and two days later I'm terrible. Well, I don't think that happens very often without knowing, gosh, I'm really tired, I should stop. Oh no, I'll do more because I used to do more. I think that's where we get into trouble. Okay? The second thing I want to point out here is that the main benefits and the additional benefits of all these forms of exercise, likewise as uh, for the risks, they're the same for people with ALS versus people who don't have ALS. While we can't say that strength, doing strength or weight training exercises is going to help someone improve their strength, we can say that it helps optimize their strengths. It helps them be as strong as possible. Now again, there's times that when that philosophy won't work necessarily, but most of the time it does. And when it doesn't, you'll know it and you'll be able to stop and say, well, now I'm just going to focus on my stretching exercises. Okay. Okay, and how to exercise. Well, what I want to point out in this horrible looking chart here is that there are no clear recommendations for people with ALS. They don't have a chart for people with ALS. These, uh, these recommendations are all based on healthy older adults over the age of 60. So what do we take from that? Well, we can see that over here, everybody should be exercising to the point of not having any other time for their lives, <laughs> right? 30 minutes there, 8 to 10 sets, 10 minutes, yeah, pretty much that's the day. <laughs> okay? And over here, three times a week. Well, if you add them up, isn't that more than seven days a week? <laughs> Maybe my math is bad. But the point I want you to take from this is that these are just general ideas, and we don't really know. But I think you will. When you exercise, I think you'll know how often it is helpful for you and how often it isn't, and how long to do it. The main point I want, to want you to take from this chart is that if you were going to manipulate or change anything, I would change this first. I would change how often or the frequency and the time. Depending on how you feel that given day or that week, I would manipulate those variables and do it more often or, uh, or longer time or whatever have you, as we'll talk about in a minute, to make yourself exercise at an appropriate level. Usually increasing the weight or trying to work really hard doesn't really pay many dividends. Okay, getting started. This is a little bit more helpful, for, I, I hope. So first of all, when, we, when someone says, I'm going to exercise, what should I do? You know, what do I start? I tell people to always go back to their team, of course, and talk to their neurologist, talk to the respiratory therapist, talk to the nutritionist, talk to everybody to make sure that we're all on the same page and how this is going to work. Okay? I do think that working with a physical therapist, at least initially, to kind of set the guidelines and set the program ideas and talk about options is very helpful. I don't always say that people have to go to outpatient physical therapy a thousand times a year, but I do think that having a little guidance and having that contact even by email or, or phone would be helpful for most people. 
safety first. And again, as we said, the big take home picture that we have is avoid fatigue or weakness lasting more than 30 to 60 minutes. So that's, when I, that's how I think people can decide if weight training or doing light weights or not is a good idea. Okay, so if you, or going on a stationary bike. Maybe that's a good idea, maybe it's not, depending on how that feels. Um, I don't think that people should be afraid to keep what they're doing steady or decreasing, depending on how they feel. On the other hand, if, you've, if you haven't been working out for a while and suddenly it feels good, if you do three successful workouts where you feel very good about what you've done, I think it's okay to go ahead a little bit more. Okay. For cardio, for you know, stationary bicycle, walking, aquatic exercise, what have you, I think it's uh, a, good time to, a good way to start is to start with the short bouts and then do it very often. And what I'd say then is that if things get better, like you feel really good, then you're gonna go ahead and increase the amount of time and, and decrease your frequency. So instead of doing 30 minutes of walking right off the bat, then maybe you'll start with 10 minutes three times a day and see how that goes, okay? Strengthening exercises, again, the emphasis as we mentioned earlier is probably gonna be on more repetitions and sets and how often you do it more than trying to get more weight. Stretching and range of motion, I usually tell people that uh, we want to work on frequent, slow, and prolonged stretching, especially if you have spasticity or that stiffness of the muscles that you can't control. Balance exercises, again, usually we don't want you to you know, stand on one foot near a stairwell and fall down. So you know, what we'll say is start with an easy challenge and focus on practice. I liken it to playing the violin or learning a musical instrument or something else where you have to train to really get good at something. Combination programs, you know, those wonderful Tai Chi, yoga, and Pilates type things. As Lee pointed out, it's really useful for people to go to the studio and talk to the instructors. And I really like people to start off with a sort of a small group or one-to-one -one instruction rather than go into a large, you know, 50-something classroom with one instructor. Just because I think there are oftentimes things that they can help you go uh, get around if you're having mobility problems or shortness of breath problems. So that's my uh, usual recommendation for that type of exercise. In aquatic exercise, the main things I think about are accessibility and safety. So making sure that you check out the facility that you might go to and, and looking on it, see if you can have uh, a partner go with you and also whatever equipment they have available to make it more uh, safe and practical. And again, uh, there's, the one exception I had to say about the sneak attack, if you will, is that sometimes people will go into the water and feel so good being in the warm water and floating and feeling great that they'll do a, a bout of exercise and not notice that they feel more tired later on. So that's the one time I'd say start small and then wait maybe a day or two to see how much you really should do. Okay. So to conclude, I think uh, you know, we, we hopefully have answered the questions for today. Should PALS or people with ALS exercise? The answer seems to be a pretty strong yes. Why? Well, we don't think there's any harm and there's multiple benefits as we discussed. When, well, really, oops, sorry, uh, it's really an any time kind of thing, but I think it also depends on the type of exercise. So if you're doing uh, light resistance training, then I think that can be done earlier. Towards the end, it may not be practical or feasible. Okay, and how? That varies depending on, I think, personal preference, on your physical condition and timing. But again, the main take home message to me is not having you, you feel fatigued or tired for more than 30 or 60 minutes afterwards. And I think that, plus your common sense, will guide you in, as far as what you should do. Okay? So these are my references, and I just want to say thank you very much for your attention. All right. Oh, that's loud, huh? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, boy, we had a bunch of great experts here. I don't, I'm not sure why they put me at the end. I have only had about four years of experience with ALS patients. And uh, my name is David Bessio, but I do work at both clinics. So I guess I got a feel for how both clinic op clinics operate. Um, I, I truly enjoy working with uh, ALS patients. Uh, it's a pleasure to come in every day, um, despite the... Um, horrible nature of the disease. Um, so I want to talk primarily about um, nutrition and, and ALS, of course. Uh, but Daniel says that I need to give a disclaimer before I start, and that, that is I do have little bitty socks on under here. But, uh, they are there. So uh, as we get started and uh, the adequacy of, of nutrition, so that's what I want you to, I'm going to come back to this time and time again. Uh, throughout this talk, because that's 
our primary uh, goal in nutrition is to maintain adequacy of caloric intake and adequacy of fluid intake. Uh, I think everybody expected me to come up and talk about constipation today as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, I hadn't planned on it, but I can, I can do that uh, off the top of my head pretty well. Probably better than I can do this talk. Uh, so uh, some potential symptoms uh, which prevent uh, the adequate intake, and some are really quite obvious. Uh, chewing and swallowing problems in bulbar patients, of course. Uh, change in, the, in those diet textures and consistencies and, and keeping up. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the, how we manage this a little bit later. So these things, of course, affect our ability uh, to, to take enough both fluids and, uh, and calories. Um, ones that people don't necessarily think about, too, is arm and hand weakness. Uh, so um, this primarily uh, beginning with um, feeding oneself, and um, we'll talk a bit, and I'm going to talk about it, some of the psychosocial things. Is, uh, we had a question in the back talking about you know, asking caregivers for help and how do you unburden them. And uh, so this becomes very difficult with the, with the limb patients who have this arm and hand weakness and asking for support to get fed. Uh, it comes up time and time again in clinics. So this can affect how much you can take in as well. And then on the fluid side, people don't think about this so much, uh, but just even the ambulating uh, can affect our ability to take enough fluid because uh, there is somewhat of an internal drive, if you will, to not take as much fluid if you can't get to a, a restroom, a toilet, as easy. That's going to prohibit or get in your way of, of taking enough fluids. Uh, Dr. Loman Hurth talked about some ways of managing uh, the toileting aspect there, and uh, it does come up in nutrition as well. So um, things that um, we think about in, in nutrition and, and, and maintaining weight, uh, because it is a primary goal. We know when people lose weight, uh, they don't maximize their survival. It's pretty clear. So one of our primary goals is to maintain weight. We want to maintain weight, maintain BMI, um, even at the expense of, of adding what we'll call fat mass instead of the fat-free mass. So it is very important to still maintain weight, even though you might be finding your, your arms and your legs uh, are, are getting smaller and your, your, your middle is getting bigger. Uh, we want you to still maintain your weight. Um, so uh, one of the things we know about ALS at this point is that it's a disease that requires more energy. And this is completely counterintuitive from what one would think. If you're not moving as much um, and, uh, uh, and not getting around, then we think that you're not going to be using as much energy. So this is uh, quite counterintuitive. Um, also, lack of muscle mass, would, one would think that, again, you don't need as much energy to feed this body. Um, but what we know is, uh, as Lee had mentioned before, um, the increased um, needs for breathing, respiratory rates, these two things influence our uh, energy needs, as well as um, some other things that are coming up that within the science and literature of ALS. Um, uh, as we know, when we get more muscle cramps, fasciculations, these things might be driving energy needs. Also, just the act of moving yourself through space, moving your arm, moving your legs through space, these things require more energy, so we're driving up our energy needs again. And then on top of that, uh, there are some more esoteric things, um, might be of uh, the cost of protein actually breaking down in our body, that muscle breaking down might be driving up our energy needs. And also uh, some things that are even more esoteric than that, which would be that the powerhouse, that cell, it stru cell structure itself, the mitochondria, might be dysfunctional and driving up our energy needs. So there's lots of things that are driving up this energy needs. So all things being equal, uh, those patients with ALS have to actually eat more to maintain their weight um, than, than somebody else. So uh, this uh, makes it a challenge because there are these things that get in the way. I talked about the chewing and swallowing problems, the arm hand weakness. And then there are some psychosocial barriers um, that go along with this too. Uh, frequently, uh, people who have been trying to manage their weight their whole life now are faced with, um, who are overweight, now are faced with this kind of choice of, okay, well, I'm, I'm losing weight, should I continue to lose weight? And the, the answer here is clearly no. And, uh, but 
this is something that can get in the way in early stages too before they might come into clinic and hear their, their, their dietician, their doctor, and all these members of the team explain to them uh, the importance of maintaining their weight and their health and their, their longevity. So uh, these things get in our way. Um, other sources of things that get in our way are depression, anxiety. Um, Dr. Lomanhurst talked about some of the medications. I'll, I'll go into some of that a little bit later as well. Um, poor appetite associated with uh, fatigue from breathing. So those sort of things also in, uh, increase our, uh, our, or decrease our ability to take foods. Along with uh, that, um, in the chewing and swallowing, when we decrease our our availability or opportunities of foods. Um, many people end up with these brown plates of food and, and things. Uh, this decreases our appetite. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about appetite a little bit later. So um, uh, in general, there are many things uh, that get in the way of us having adequate calorie and fluid intake. So moving forward. So the other parts of my, you know, my talk here is A plus nutrition. So the other A here is one that maybe is a little bit more esoteric. Um, but this is something that I, I notice really anecdotally. Um, there's kind of a new, new mindfulness sort of uh, uh, movement. And um, one of the things that we talk about is acceptance. Um, and this is a very challenging thing. And um, uh, many of the patients, of course, when they first come in, aren't going to be in that place. Um, and it's understandable. Um, but as you move forward, kind of recognizing and validating yourself for who you are now at this time is empowering because it lets you know this is, this is something that I, that I am right now, and now I can make changes for the future. I can begin to work on doing something that's going to help myself and help myself live uh, independently and live well. It doesn't mean just because you accept something doesn't mean that you're giving up. It means that you're going to take control um, of, of what's happening right now. Um, so I don't have that much to add on this, but it, to me it's a very important stage in maintaining adequate nutrition. And um, so, uh, and I've had, you know, again, many patients, many people I work with who, um, who find this, this step is a very hard step to get over, and it's a hard step in the move beyond. So um, another part of my A's here are adaptive responses. Fortunately, uh, we're very, uh, maybe we are the most adaptive species although I have a raccoon who's living in my backyard who might be disputing me on this one. Uh, so, uh, and I live right here in San Francisco, right in the middle of the city, so I don't know how he's handling it. So, uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, some of the solutions uh, that we know that we're gonna do to promote uh, adequate intake. Oh, I'm already at five minutes, oh, shoot. There we go. So, uh, I'm gonna be quick on this one then. So, because we talk about this in clinic, many of you meet with me. Um, are going to be textural modifications. Easy first things uh, Dr. Loman Hurth talked about were small bites, small pieces, um, and, uh, and moving forward through this. This might be making things more moist. Um, lots of things that we do, but it really does require this adaptation. Then along with, and this is where you'll be working with the speech language pathologist very closely, and it's the dietitian's role then to work within these modifications and say, here's how I can maximize your caloric intake. Here's how I can maximize your fluid intake during the day with these recommendations from the speech language pathologist or perhaps from a, a modified barium uh, swallow study or something along those lines. And that's the dietitian's role is to work within that, that framework. So we work very closely as a team, both at uh, Forbes Norris and at UCSF. Um, then uh, the dietitian will also work with the uh, occupational therapist to discuss eating aids. Um, with patient, this might be um, splints, adaptive grips. Um, it may be even very low-tech things like putting a, uh, a sandwich in a coffee filter to eat it out of a filter so it doesn't fall out. So uh, along with uh, this, uh, some of the things we, Lee talked about, breathing support and uh, some of the uh, techniques there to improve. Um, but breathing support, one of the things that I then talk about when I find that patients are starting to have problems is uh, energy conservation. And this is something that will come up in, in dialogue. So even though a patient can still eat a regular diet and eat these textures and consistency, I might encourage them to, be, uh, to start gearing towards softer, more manageable, moist foods. Um, we talk about small, frequent meals, but we also talk about meals coming in between 
um, to reduce those energy needs, and also liquid calories, because that might be easier for them to manage and drink uh, liquid calories than it might be for them to chew and swallow and go through the effort that leads to fatigue. Um, high calorie, high protein diets. Um, these are something uh, that are pretty obvious that the dietitian works with. Um, now, I think the the sense on high protein maybe at later stages in the do, in the in the course of the disease actually when mobility becomes a bigger issue and we have to worry about skin dysfunction because it's really about calories and getting in those maximizing of calories. Um, feeding tube, this is something that's uh, managed as a, as a group. Uh, the MD, the, the dietitian, the respiratory therapist, the speech language pathologist, we will all come together in this discussion to discuss this with the, with the patient. Um, it, it, it doesn't just come out of the blue. Uh, from one of the one of the uh, practitioners, um, there are different stances I would say within clinics too, and this might be something that that comes up too within the discussion. Uh, social emotional support, uh, again, quite important for people to to know that they're not alone. Um, Amy talked about that. Um, uh, communicating one's needs are really important, and from a nutrition standpoint. Uh, it's it's uh, maybe one of the most primary uh, importance because as you get further along in the disease, you're going to require more and more support from those around you. So it's uh, it's really quite uh, important. Then um, moving forward to my last day, I want to say a few words about these things because they come up in conversation quite frequently. Uh, there are alternative alternative nutrition diet therapy. Um, one thing that comes up frequently is you know should I be on a gluten free diet? Um, and within a gluten-free diet, uh, there, you know, I guess the, the primary answer here is no, you don't have to be. If you feel better, you have less GI distress or other things that are happening, then fine, as long as you're meeting that first word, which was adequacy, and you're making, getting in enough calories and you're getting in enough fluid to meet your needs to, to maintain your weight and your fluid intake. High fat low carbohydrate diet. Um, there's some rationale here that fat may be protective of nerve um, cells. Um, the literature I don't think quite yet supports this. Um, intuitively, uh, it, it makes some sense to me, both from a, a nutrition standpoint and from a, and from a kind of a respiratory therapy standpoint. But um, the literature doesn't seem to support it at this point. Um, on the counter side of the nutrition argument, um, we do know that high-fat, low-carbohydrate diets are used for weight loss. So um, is this really the direction we want to go? I think we, um, we really need to pay attention to, to this literature as it comes out. It may work in a mouse model, um, but does it work in a human model? Uh, the paleo diet, again, comes up frequently. This is a, it can be a relatively healthy diet, but it's also an exclusionary diet. So it takes out a lot of different foods from our foods, from our uh, regular diet. So it can lead to weight loss. In fact, it was probably designed as primarily a health and weight loss diet. So um, you know, my, my sense on that one is, again, um, it can be used as long as um, we, we don't over-restrict and lose weight. The vitamin mineral supplementation, supplementation Deanna protocol, I'm going to kind of ask people to kind of look for, to ALS Untangled. They've reviewed it well, very well, and it hasn't come up yet in conversation. Uh, it's a great website, great bit of literature, Dr. Loman Hearth as well as Dr. Miller serves on this um, team of reviewers, and they reviewed the Deanna protocol and um, vitamin and mineral supplementation, and uh, really had found um, no great evidence to support using it at this point. Uh, there's a, I believe there's a small study going on at Duke, and it doesn't look positive at this point. Um, again, we have to remember that mice studies do not always translate to humans. Um, and so, although there do seem to be some positives about what some of these vitamin minerals might do, that doesn't always bear out. Um, cannabis, um, I'd like to say, dude, this might be okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not sure, again, the verdict is out. Uh, I, I personally, looking at the, the kind of literature on this, I think it has the most, one of the most promising areas. Um, unfortunately, doing research with cannabis is extraordinarily dif difficult. Uh, again, uh, uh, ALS Untangled reviews, reviews this very well. So um, to wrap up, uh, I want to get back to my primary A, which is adequacy. Um, adequacy of caloric intake to maintain weight. Adequacy of fluid intake. This will also help with energy intake, or energy 
because uh, you'll feel a little better when you're hydrated well. It may also help with constipation management, which everybody expected me to talk about. So, uh, so uh, next time I come, I'll talk about constipation, I promise. So uh, thank you all very much for your time. Um, this is for Lee regarding respiratory. I haven't heard very much in terms of use of a sip and puff at, or the diaphragmatic um, pacemaker. I've heard of them, but I haven't heard a lot about them. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on those. Yeah, I'm sorry there wasn't time to go into all of these things in my talk today. Um, sip ventilation basically is a way to use a portable mechanical ventilator used non-invasively with a mask or nasal pillows at night. Uh, but for respiratory support during the day and for lung expansion or what we sometimes call a side breath, that's what sip ventilation or sip and puff ventilation or mouthpiece ventilation is for. So it allows you to, um, with an angled mouthpiece or just a little shortened um, tube, to access a breath whenever you want. Um, it's sitting sort of right here, or you can hold it depending on what your upper extremities um, are like, but you just sort of have a little kiss breath, and it'll deliver a big breath for you. And the size of that breath is something that can be uh, determined by you and your respiratory care practitioner in what's available for you. But it really does help having that big breath, having that um, additional Flow on exhalation can improve a vault, uh, voice projection. You can use it for short periods to rest during the day. If you're still uh, working and you need to talk to uh, a group um, and you want that uh, louder voice, uh, or just to rest during the day without having to put on a cumbersome interface, which often um, is sort of a barrier between you and other people. Uh, diaphragm pacing, um, it's still being researched, and um, so we are running, we're one of the centers at CPMC who's involved in uh, national trials. I think we're trying to find out, the jury's out, but we're trying to find out if there um, are subsets of the ALS patient population that might benefit from it the most. It may not be great for everyone, but there might be a subset that, would, that it would be ideal for, but we really don't have the results of those studies yet. Thank you. A question for David. If, if you're early in ALS and you find yourself much more hungry than you normally would, is it just following that need to eat more? And also, uh, if, in terms of weighing, if you're averse to weighing yourself, uh, normally how frequently should you be weighing yourself? So there are two questions there, right? So, um, if you're hungry, of course, eat. The literature seems pretty um, conclusive that, that overfeeding is not a problem. Uh, so continuing to eat is fine. Um, now we have seen some patients actually gain a bit of weight and we kind of go, oh, well, maybe you don't need to overfeed quite that much. But um, it doesn't seem to be a problem to overfeed, um, to eat too much as far as, um, so Appetite can be fine, so go ahead and go eat. The other part of the question, um, uh, again, um, uh oh, I lost it. Where'd it go? <laughs> Two part. Sorry. Uh, how frequently should you be weighing yourself? How often? How often should you weigh yourself? Um, well, I work in a weight management clinic as well, so I'll hook, take it from that side. In general, uh, once or twice a week is kind of the number to look at. So if you go any more than that, I think you're going to be looking at fluid shifts you're gonna be getting um, upset by that, that fluid shift back and forth. Get on a regular schedule, um, Friday morning or whatever it is, to, to weigh yourself consistently, um, particularly early on. Once a week is fine. Um, as mobility gets impaired, then we have, to, we have to be a little bit more cautious. We don't want someone to weigh themselves at the risk of falling down and um, hurting themselves by trying to balance.
So, so, uh, for Lee, for physical therapy, actually, you, you, uh, this is adequate uh, exercise. Uh, in like literature, say you actually excess when you feel tired, and this is actually your um, your point where you can you need to stop. But what actually I feel uh, actually I find out, it's actually for long run it help if you slightly exercise more than you should. Maybe ne not next day you got tired. This is your kind of. Uh, kind of um, stop what you should use. But like in maybe in a couple of days, you feel better. So what do we think? Exercise a lot, next day you feel tired, but maybe day after you feel much better. What do you think about it? I think that's an interesting question. I think uh, if a person can conclusively say they feel better after exercise, even if that's a day or two later, I think it's possible that it could be a delayed reaction and that'd be fine. Uh, the usual recommendation for 30 to 60 minutes has been based mostly on expert opinion rather than research. So I think it, uh, I would take, a, a, when that happens, when there's a little bit of a question, my usual recommendation is for people to write down a, sort of an exercise log or you know, a book to sort of record what they did and how they feel you know, after that. And I think if you find that you do feel better you know, two days later, but maybe more tired that day. I, I think if the overall trend is positive and it looks like that's helping you maintain or you maybe even feel better, I'd be supportive of that. Oh, oh, that's me. Okay. So, a a Amy, can you uh, uh, expand on just a little bit on the, your uh, comment on Windows tablets I versus iPads, but also Android? And, and yeah. What yeah. are the features that make it better? Yeah. Well, we all love our iPads, so it's hard to hear, but... Uh, <laughs> and, and we love our Androids and Windows, too, some of us. Um, so the main reason that I dissuade people from investing, if they haven't already done so in an iPad, is because it has the least number of alternative access methods that you can use with it. Uh, many of us don't really notice, but you, don't, you can't use a mouse with an iPad. You can use it with an Android or a Windows device. And almost all the alternative access methods, not all of them, but almost all of them, are where you move a mouse, either with foot movement, uh, a touchpad, a mouse, uh, even eye tracking requires the movement of a cursor around the screen. An iPad doesn't give you that. So you go from using a keyboard or an external uh, Bluetooth keyboard to scanning. And scanning is another topic, but you don't get them all the mouse options that are in there that most of the people I work with use. So we, we miss out on that. If someone already has an iPad, though, I absolutely, and they've got good arm and hand function, I think it's wonderful to get an app on there and, and use that. And, and also, Windows right now is probably the best for eye tracking, and Android is right in the middle. Um, Android you know, could change any, any, at any point now. Uh, but I like Androids a lot, too, because you can use a mouse with an Android. You need often an adapter, whereas with a Windows device, you just plug the USB right in. Hi, guys. Uh, Joyce here wanted to add, um, juicing an isosaur worked great for her. Just to dietitian. This question is from my, from my husband. He's using BiPAP right now, and he's asking, what is better with BiPAP? I use at night low IPAP, EPAP, and less mask leakage, or high pressure and more leakage. I don't know whether you got the question. I, I think I got that. Um, if with with the, it's like the higher pressures that might be needed are creating more mask leaks. Was that, was that part of it? He's saying yes. Yes, um, but your, 
that that can be a problem, especially if the pressures that you require, the inspiratory pressures, uh, are very high. Often you do get mask leaks. Um, uh, you can try alternative. I mean, there are different styles of mask out there. Maybe trying a different mask would work. Um, and you mentioned the e the EPAP is something that we try to keep lower to, to decrease your work of breathing, but that that high pressure um, sometimes can can create a leak. So we could try some alternative masks. Um, another thing that we could try if you're on a, a machine that's focusing on pressure, is that we might do better switching you to a machine that targets volume and has pressure variable. So that might be another way to reduce that high pressure while giving you adequate, adequate lung volume replacement. Um, so I'm, um, I hope that you certainly can uh, uh, communicate with me by email if you would like um, at the uh, the Forbes Norris Center, or you can talk more about this to the respiratory therapist in, in your clinic. Um, but there are alternative types of breath delivery that we might be able to work with to reduce that mask le leakage for you while providing good lung volume expansion. I think we have some questions from the internet. Can you hear? The first question from the internet is, I have ALS, are there any exercises that you recommend that I can still do with my family so that it doesn't seem like work? Um, so that's a great question. And I think the key point that I picked up on the question has to do with it doesn't seem like work. And I, I don't think exercise has to be work. Uh, if someone has been uh, doing exercises with their family in the past, I usually encourage them to stay with that as long as it's practical. Um, exercise, again, the main purposes that we talked about, strength, flexibility, balance, um, you know, uh, cardiovascular health or endurance, those are all things that to keep in mind in, as far as what's going on. So are there things to do? Yes. Are there special ones that I tell people with ALS to do? No. I think it really depends on how it feels and how it benefits that person. Any other questions? The next question from the internet is, should people with ALS consider having a humidifier to aid with their breathing? Uh, I'm assuming that there's a humidifier that's attached to um, the positive pressure breathing device. And if that's the case, I would say always. If you don't have an integrated heated humidifier with your breathing device, then your, your airways are going to get very dry. And that can lead to um, a dry mouth, which is uncomfortable. But if your airways become dry, then they cannot fulfill their natural cleaning function. So um, it should always be included. In terms of a room humidifier, I, that may affect just the comfort of your breathing when you're breathing without the breathing device, especially if you're, it's winter and you're using, um, you have the heat on. The room can be very dry and that can cause your airways to be dry. So that would be good when you're breathing spontaneously. But when you're using a positive pressure breathing device, you always need a heated humidifier and to um, make sure that you, um, make sure that the humidity is adequate for that because they always have adjustments for that. Okay, well, thank you um, for all your questions. Um, we have our panel of experts who are going to be here for the next um, uh, 30 minutes. Um, we, at this time, we'd like to take a little break.